span of 20 years, war has ravaged the oil-rich Middle East four times. In 1991, an Allied army fought to drive Iraqi invaders from Kuwait. When the Gulf War was over, the Iraqi army had been shattered. But the oil fields of Kuwait were in flames. Western oil men had come to depend upon the petroleum of the Persian Gulf. For 40 years, oil men have lived with the knowledge that 60% of the world's oil reserves are in the Gulf region, in that very volatile, rather feudal area where modern forces are constantly clashing with, with the old religious habits. The horror of the war is etched in the memory of Kuwait's former oil minister. When you have uh, your young people killed, when you have young women raped, when you see for pure hatred, oil fields are set afire. These are something very graphic in the memory of Kuwaitis. The Gulf War and the fate of Kuwait were the result of historical forces that were set in motion 20 years earlier. For more than a century, Kuwait and the Gulf states had been protected by the British. But in 1971, to the dismay of some emirs, there was an abrupt and fateful change in the balance of power. Our defense planning will be based on the withdrawal of all our forces from the Persian Gulf to take effect by the end of 1971. The British withdrawal east of Suez left a clear military vacuum in the region and to some extent a political vacuum. Uh, the Americans were ill-suited to f fill that vacuum, partly because of our connection with Israel, and uh, largely because the American public did not want to acquire any additional responsibilities around the world, and the American public determines foreign policy. So to fill the vacuum and counter the Soviets, President Nixon turned to the Shah of Iran. Armed by the West, the Shah was to safeguard the Gulf and its oil. It is significant to note that of all of the areas in the world which pose a potential threat to peace in the world, that Iran is in a very key central area. The Shah was eager to become the region's policeman, perhaps too eager. Remember, this was the King of Kings. This was a man who insisted on being called his Imperial Majesty. Iran was an empire. Well, in fact, Iran was a nation. It was the Persian nation. But the Shah saw it and built it up as an empire. It was this kind of grandiose ambition that eventually led to his downfall. The $100 million that the Shah lavished on his own coronation not only offended fundamentalist religious leaders at home, but led many abroad to question his judgment. He tried to identify himself with the great kings and emperors who built vast Persian empires in the past. And he wanted to show the world that Iran's past glory and Iran's future plans did give him every reason to hope for the great civilization, which was his dream, his vision. 
of the future of his country. The Shah wanted German industrial strength and English pomp and circumstance. The Shah of Iran intended to show the world that he had grand ideas and plans for developing Iran, which naturally had to be fueled by the petroleum and its revenue. To finance his ambitions, the Shah was forcing rapid increases in Iranian oil output. But the King of Kings had no power over the price of oil. It is with money from oil that we are building up our country, that we are building the dam, that we are promoting agriculture and industry and the rest of it. We are getting less money for oil, which is an something that uh, is exhausted at the end. It's not eternal, it's an eternal source of uh, supply. 20 years, 30 years, 50 years time, it will finish. In many cases, this is the only source of wealth of some countries. Arab oil producing countries also felt that the West was getting a free ride. The entire demand and the expectation in the West of cheap energy, it fueled industrial civilization. The West took this availability of cheap supplies as, a, as its own birthright. Uh, it was going to be there. Uh, the Arabs and the Iranians, as the uh, lingo of the time had it, had no choice. They couldn't drink it. They had to sell it. And this was the expectation that these people would sell at our prices, uh, that there would be no consequences for the prosperity and for the autonomy and the independence of the West. When Sir Peter Walters became BP's chairman, it was still half-owned by the British government, and oil companies were the focus of rising nationalism. Morning, Arthur. How are you? Under the old concession system, BP owned its oil outright. The old concessional system and equity crude was really what BP was all about until perhaps the mid-60s, uh, early 70s, when life changed. But BP was based on Iran and Iraq and Kuwait and the whole system of being probably the best in the world at finding crude and who's a company whose fortunes were totally dependent on that old system. Much of BP's oil came from the small city-state of Kuwait, located at the head of the Persian Gulf. It sits on 10% of the world's oil supplies. For many years, the driving force behind Kuwait's emerging oil industry was Sheikh Ali Khalifa Al Sabah, a member of Kuwait's royal family. Kuwait was a poor country and a very poor region. To a certain degree, we were better than some of the countries around us in terms of being able to engage in trade and pearl fishing. For years, pearl fishing kept the Kuwaiti economy afloat. And then when the Japanese developed cultured pearls at the end of the 1920s, Kuwait's economy was devastated. Oil transformed Kuwait. In 1938, BP and the American company Gulf struck oil. Kuwait's wealth began to build up, but so did its resentment of foreign companies. My generation was, if you grew up in the Middle East in the 50s and the 60s, the, the oil companies were monstrous bloodsuckers. Uh, you know, get rid of them, uh, and a brand new world shall be created in, in the region. The cartel, the Seven Sisters, they had the magic, they had the power, they had the force. And so there was this tremendous sense of these overbearing, powerful entities. And of people feeling at the mercy of these companies. Gulf and BP had invested treasure and emotions for decades in Kuwait. We thought of ourselves and the Kuwaitis together building something that was important to both of us, and we thought that we were part of that team, we were part of that family. 
It was a great uh, disappointment and it was a shock, really an emotional shock to realize they didn't think of it as family at all. Uh, they thought they had been exploited. The activities of Western oil companies meant a large expatriate community. Too often, they made Kuwaitis feel like foreigners in their own country. The attitude of the foreign oil companies, especially a company like uh, British Petroleum, was to treat the nationals as something below their own nationals. You may not believe it, but as late as 1959, the Habara Club, which is Sina staff club in Ahmadi, the Kuwaiti engineers were not allowed to become members. It took the personal intervention of the man who is today the Emir of Kuwait to end the club's discrimination against Kuwaitis. But the resentment lingered on. It didn't seem to us, I think, that we necessarily were doing the wrong thing. But looking back, one realizes more and more, I think, what the seeds of nationalism were leading to. People felt that important decisions affecting their own life and their own country was being made in London or Pittsburgh. This they did not accept and wanted these decisions for good or for bad to be taken by themselves under their own political system. I always believe that the price of oil in the short term is decided politically. In the long term, the economical factors will prevail. And this is what happened in the past, and this is what's happening today. At a traditional family engagement party, the man introducing the bride to the groom, the Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Yamani. Saudi Arabia's oil minister was a natural matchmaker. You know, Sheikh Yamani was the quintessential character of the 1970s. It was no longer the simple person of the desert. It was a child of the peninsula who had been educated in the West, who was going to cut a better deal for the Arabs with the West, and who knew the tricks of the West. This was Yamani. Ahmed Zaki Yamani combined the old and the new. He took over as oil minister at a young age. He had a, an extraordinary patience in negotiations. Uh, and uh, as uh, one oil man said uh, uh, in the early 1970s, uh, he drives you to the wall with sweet reasonableness. Like the Shah of Iran, Yamani believed the oil prices the West was paying were unreasonably low. At a conference in Tehran, hosted by the Shah, the oil companies were brought to the negotiating table and forced to increase the price of oil by 35 cents a barrel. The oil producing countries themselves were able to ask for a seat at that table because they, at this time in the early 1970s, were beginning to say, the oil is mine. I can produce it how I want to produce it, develop it the way I want to, and if you don't so agree, you, the oil companies, I'm going to exercise my own control over that. The Tehran Agreement gave the oil producers for the first time the right to join the oil companies in fixing the price of oil. Their hand became strengthened by the simple realization that oil demand itself was outstripping the potential growth in available supply. This meant the power was shifted to the hands of those who owned the oil and who produced the oil, it becoming a seller's market. This shift in the marketplace was an ominous development for Western interests. The growing and insatiable demand of the Western industrial nations for oil coming on top of a tightening world oil market meant that the oil exporters were acquiring a new form of power, a political power, and a political power that could be transformed into something called the oil weapon. Egypt's president, Anwar Sadat, planned to use the oil weapon against Israel. King Faisal of Saudi Arabia promised his support and on U.S. television warned of what might happen. We do not wish to place any restrictions on our oil exports to the United States. 
But as I mentioned, America's complete support of Zionism against the Arabs makes it extremely difficult for us to continue to supply the United States' petroleum needs or even to maintain our friendship with the United States. Washington ignored the omens. Saudi Arabia had tried to warn the United States throughout the spring and summer of 1973 that if war came, and if the United States helped Israel to a great extent, there would be a violent reaction in the Arab world, and that oil would be used as a weapon in this war. The American government chose not to believe those warnings. In October 1973, on the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, Egyptian forces stormed across the Suez Canal. Syrian forces attacked in the north. Caught by surprise, the Israelis reeled back. Vienna, OPEC countries were preparing to meet the Western oil companies and force prices up again. Delegates were still arriving on the very day that the Arab-Israeli war broke out. Two wars were being waged, one on the battlefields in the Middle East and one in the corridors of the Intercontinental Hotel. Both were to shake the world. October 73 is the time when OPEC alone decided on the price of oil without the oil companies. Twos and trees would get together in somebody's suite, like Yamani's suite. We knew what was the price of products and the price of crude oil. And we wanted to have our share as fairly as it is possible. For us as oil men, it was the whole question of the future of Western dependency on Middle Eastern oil that was at stake. We knew that the oil companies were going to put a stiff resistance. We were talking about increases and. 35, 40 cents a barrel. So we asked for an increase in our prices up to $6 per barrel. We felt that this is an opportunity to wrestle from the hand of the oil companies the ability to sit with us and discuss the prices. Nervous Arab delegates kept tuning their radios to hear the latest reports from the battlefront. For them, the news was good. Overwhelmed and fearing defeat, Israel begged President Nixon for more weapons. The United States wanted to see Israel resupplied, but it still wanted to keep its hand hidden. Uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, told me to persuade the Israelis to unload the planes at night and we would only bring in American airlift under the cover of darkness. The airlift was launched somewhat later than we had hoped and instead of coming down under the cover of darkness, the first U.S. planes began to drop down into Israel in bright daylight on Sunday morning under television cameras. It was a little hard under those circumstances to keep the American hand hidden. The tide of battle turned in Israel's favor. As talks broke down in Vienna, the OPEC delegates flew to Kuwait City. They were barely off the plane when they took a momentous decision. We came 
to Kuwait. The whole OPEC came to Kuwait to discuss what we can agree on in terms of OPEC. We met the first night and we decided on two things. First, a substantial increase in price. The next day we met as Arab oil producers to decide what we could do to support the Arab side in the conflict. In the Kuwait Sheraton, Arab exporters agreed to carry out King Faisal's threat and unsheath the oil weapon. The battle was going so much against the Arab side. And during the latter part of that war, it was inevitable that we would use whatever at our disposal to bring to the world attention the need to address and resolve this Arab-Israeli problem. And that's when we decided to cut back on production. The Arab oil embargo caused panic and chaos throughout the West. Well, I live uh, down below here. I went to 96th Street, and boy, there's a line about a mile long. So I says, I'll never get to Monroe. In America, gasoline prices leapt by 40%. I understand only giving $4 worth, and uh, that's not going to give me much driving. Gas lines stretched for blocks. For the Americans, the long lines at the gasoline stations, the sense of an imperial power being challenged by these people on the hinterland of the world, and suddenly people realize that their very lives and prosperity and conveniences depend uh, on, on outsiders. The embargo produced a great shock in the industrial world. We'd had a period of sustained growth since World War II. This was the most serious blow to the world economy at one specific moment that we had seen. Though all but paralyzed by the Watergate scandal, the Nixon White House was suddenly forced to focus on the Middle East. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger embarked on a seemingly endless round of shuttle diplomacy. Henry Kissinger used to say that he didn't know anything about any part of the world south of the Pyrenees. He didn't care about the third world. He didn't care about the Arab world. And he, always, he even told the Egyptians, he said, folks, I only handle crises when they're hot. Oil was hot and oil brought him to the region. That's why he went. That's what, what the entire shuttle diplomacy was about, a way of ending the oil embargo. The oil shock struck Japan. By December, oil prices had doubled again. Facing the oil crisis of 1973, everybody in Japan sensed the country is in danger. Thus, his or her individual future is also in danger. So, uh, something serious should be done to cope with the situation. Now, Ohiro Amaya became the moving force behind an extraordinary transformation of Japan's industrial strategy. So far, the Japanese industry was heavily depending upon the consumption of oil. The Japanese government thought that the Japanese industrial structure should be reformed. The move away from oil to a future based on computers and high technology made Japan what it is today. The benefit of oil shock was tremendous for Japanese to wake up in the understanding of the importance of the information-oriented technology. In the rush towards energy efficiency, the Japanese put computer chips to work everywhere even in the most humble household gadgets. Even the washing machine, now we have integrated circuits in the washing machine. So even washing machine is not just like a muscle washing the material. Delicate control. So most of the things with control, that is the use of knowledge. We are very poor of natural resources underground. 
whereas we are pretty rich of uh, resources up here. For Japan, the oil crisis proved to be a blessing in disguise. The success of today's fuel-efficient Japanese cars dates back to then. Up until the early 1970s, Japanese cars were not a force in the world market. But when the oil crisis occurred, suddenly the emphasis on the part of people buying cars shifted from high performance and speed to fuel efficiency. And lo and behold, here are all these Toyotas and these Nissans and these Hondas that were just waiting at dockside in Japan, uh, quality cars and cars with very high fuel efficiency. And they just moved in and captured markets in the United States and all over the world. And of course, became a very powerful, if not dominant presence in the, interna in the international automobile market. The great oil shock laid the base for Japan's success today. The Japanese overcame their fear and pessimism. Cars, computers, electronics, and energy saving were to make Japan an economic superpower. Billions of petrodollars began to flow into traditional societies like Saudi Arabia. At the car auction in Jeddah, ordinary Saudis could afford to pay cash on the barrel head. OPEC was now in the driver's seat. New and vast wealth is now suddenly in the hands of the Arabs, and they had a sense that now uh, all the things of the West, but not the ways of the West, mind you, just the things of the West, the machines of the West, the industries of the West, could be bought off the rack, and that all this could be the Arabs for the asking. The oil exporters had earned $23 billion in 1972 total. By the middle 1970s, their earnings were upwards of $140 billion, a six-fold increase in their earnings. Newfound pride brought with it a fresh determination to take complete control of their own oil industries. In the early days, the oil companies treated the supplier nations with some degree of indifference, if not arrogance. That was resented. The suppliers felt humiliated, and they took their revenge in later years when the whip hand changed. And in those later years, it was the oil companies that felt humiliated by being forced to sit around waiting for acknowledgement of their mere presence. We were treated with hostility. Our arguments were treated with contempt. The Kuwaitis were very tough. They wanted us out, and we assumed that we had a future together with them. We had worked with Kuwait for years, been very close to them. We had spent large amounts of money and it was unthinkable to us that we were being thrown out. The oil companies were trying to get over the psychological barrier, as it were, of knowing that no longer do they control the oil industry in Kuwait, that this is a new era. When it became clear to them that the Kuwaitis were going to nationalize their concessions, BP and Gulf insisted on $2 billion in compensation. The Kuwaitis gave them $50 million. The majors, the international companies, and the smaller companies found that they no longer had these big reserves of oil in the oil-producing countries, and so the number one issue for them began, became to replace those reserves, and that meant a great global oil hunt. The companies intensified their search for oil under the deep, cold waters of the North Sea. 
was a gamble, but we knew we had a tremendous reserve there. We were lucky in one sense in that by the time North Sea Oil, particularly Fortisfield, came onto the market, the oil price had gone up four or five times from the price at which the decision had been taken, and it transformed the industry. Soon, more oil was being produced from the North Sea than from many of the OPEC countries. Ironically, OPEC's new higher prices helped make such ventures economic. During the 70s, when the Shah of Iran was there, he wanted to build out of Iran a super military power in the area. He wanted to raise the price of oil for reasons other than economical reasons. The Saudis wanted to keep the price of oil going up very slightly, reasonably, so we do not hurt the economy of the West and we do not hurt the annual increases in demand. The shock of the oil embargo and the great increase in prices drove Western countries and industrialized countries to bring into being conservation policies that before they ignored. It changed the whole situation. It reversed the power equation. And the Shah, like other rulers in the region, suddenly found himself without the kind of revenues to carry out the kind of am grandiose and ambitious schemes that he saw at the beginning of the 1970s. The great increase in the price of oil, the power that oil gave, the illusion of power that the oil gave to the Shah helped destroy him. It was kind of a poison chalice for the Shah. The Iranian Revolution exploded in all its fury and shook the world of oil to its foundations. As students and religious fundamentalists took to the streets, the system established to guarantee Middle East oil supplies was rapidly heading towards ruin. The Shah, who had been the policeman of the region, could no longer serve that function. And when he fell, that Western influence declined seriously. Only a handful of people witnessed the Shah's departure into exile on January 15, 1979. The fall of the Shah was, of course, precipitated by strikes in the oil fields that reduced uranium production to zero from five million barrels a day. And it had a uh, disconcerting effect on the oil market. Two weeks later, a million people thronged the streets as the Ayatollah Khomeini, implacably opposed to the West, returned from exile and took power. The Iranian revolution caused the price of oil to jump several times and the companies were panicking. And the price of oil kept going up and up again. For Western motorists, the second oil shock was 1973 all over again. Even though he'd warned of a new energy crisis, the upheaval helped to destroy the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Good evening. Tonight I want to have an unpleasant talk with you about a problem that's unprecedented in our history. With the exception of preventing war, this is the greatest challenge that our country will face during our lifetime. The world is not prepared for the future. During the 1950s, people used twice as much oil as during the 1940s. I've been sitting here since 8 o'clock this morning. How about not I didn't go to work yesterday because I have no gas? During the 1960s, we used twice as much as during the 1950s. And in each of those decades, more oil was consumed than in all of man's previous history combined. And the oil price actually touched $40 a barrel. Everybody thought there was a, now a permanent shortage of oil. But of course, with 2020 hindsight, you could look back and see that there was no shortage. There was no actual shortage. There was a panic, there was hoarding, but no shortage. But virtually no one saw that at the time. <laughs> 
We thought that we could get away with practically anything in terms of increasing the oil prices. I think that is when, uh, that is the zenith of OPEC power. And perhaps at that time, uh, we allowed that feeling of power to go into our head. Vienna, September 1980. OPEC was meeting to plan a grand celebration of its 20th anniversary. Within minutes of its opening, the meeting broke up in confusion and OPEC's unity was shattered. Far away in Baghdad, Iraq's strongman Saddam Hussein had launched an attack on one of his OPEC brethren. You had the feeling sitting with Saddam of being in the presence of a coiled boy constrictor who was ready to strike at any moment. But this man, very ambitious man, man with great designs and with an absolute ruthlessness to carry them out would mark Middle Eastern history very deeply. He saw in the demise of the Iranian state and in the demise of the Shah, the great opportunity for the emergence of Baghdad as, as, the, as the dominant power in the region and as the dominant capital in the region. It was inevitable that somebody like Saddam would venture into adventures like the Iran-Iraqi war. Without warning, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. Very much in his mind was the possibility either to control the oil fields of southwestern Iran or to destroy them, to make sure that Iran would not have the kind of power based on its oil production that Iraq would have in the future. By disrupting oil supplies from Iran and Iraq, the war distorted the world oil market and misled OPEC. I think, in essence, that war concealed the weaknesses that OPEC was already feeling, in the sense that the war further reduced the Iraqi-Iranian supply and gave us a misguided sense that we could continue on doing what we were doing, keeping the price of oil very high in face of falling demand. Reasons for that fall in demand could be found in some of the remotest parts of the world. In Alaska, three companies, BP, Exxon, and Arco, were rushing to develop the huge reserves beneath the frozen tundra of the North Slope. It was an epic undertaking. I think the first thing that I knew about BP in Alaska was when my old friend and colleague Monty Pennell, who was in charge of BP's exploration activities worldwide, came into our weekly meeting one morning and said, well, chaps, he said, uh, I'm afraid we've stumbled into more oil and it's in Alaska. Media reaction was heart sank. How much is it going to cost to get it out? The Brooks Range, 9,000 feet high. How are you going to pump oil 900 miles through the permafrost and over the mountain ranges? By the early 1980s, a quarter of U.S. domestic production, more than two million barrels a day, was being pumped through these pipes. The balance of oil power was shifting again. It didn't take very long for supply and demand to catch up with the OPEC countries. They thought that uh, they could raise the prices as high as they wanted and consumers would pay the price, but with uh, conservation and alternative energy sources and non-OPEC oil, that didn't prove the case. In 1983, just four years after the second oil shock, OPEC had to cut its prices. Oil from Alaska, the North Sea, and elsewhere was eating into OPEC's market share. That forced them to institute quotas where they would keep their production, they said, 
at 17 and a half million barrels a day. Just four years earlier, they had been producing 31 million barrels a day. Oil prices were now established in the daily din of futures trading in New York. It was another ominous turn for OPEC. What the quotas and the price cuts really were pointing to was that control over pricing itself, which OPEC had taken in 1973, was slipping out of OPEC's hands into the so-called opener commodity market. What this really meant is that oil, which had been the great strategic commodity, was also becoming just another commodity like gold and coffee and cocoa and pork bellies. You know, in 79, when the price of oil started to go up so highly, so many OPEC members became so intoxicated. It's a real pleasure. It's like a lady getting pregnant. That was a moment of pleasure. But thereafter, that little pregnancy brought with it pain, and the pain increased gradually until we had the painful delivery in 1986. And the price of oil collapsed. At the beginning of 1986, crude oil prices plunged from $29 a barrel to 10. Market forces now ruled. OPEC was no longer in the driver's seat. In 1986, oil prices collapsed. The OPEC countries found that uh, their market share was getting smaller and smaller. Saudi Arabia was actually at one point producing less oil than the British sector of the North Sea. For the oil industry, the sudden dramatic fall in their revenues came as a great shock, and it meant that the companies went through a major and immediate crisis of contraction, of cutting budgets and uh, cutting employment and becoming smaller companies. For the public, the price collapse was terrific. It meant that they were seeing prices that they had never expected to see again. price of gas down to zero. The battle cry was sounded just after six this morning. Within minutes, the battlefields were packed. This North Austin service station and another on the south side went all out to win a radio station contest aimed at slashing gasoline prices. Both owners agreed to give their gas away from 6 a.m. till the stuff ran out. By mid-morning, double lines stretched more than a mile at each station. Rules of the day permitted up to 15 free gallons per car. There was now so much oil in the world that prices were hardly affected when the long, bloody war between Iran and Iraq spilled over into the rest of the Gulf. Since the start of the war, Iraq thought of bringing pressure against Iran by hitting their oil terminals. Iran thought of retaliating by hitting Iraqi tankers going out of the Gulf and later, tankers of other countries that were helpful to Iraq, like Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. And that's why we went to the United States, to the UK, and to the Soviet Union to reflag under their national flag and get the protection of their navies. What I think that it was, was an indication of the final takeover of the, by the United States of responsibilities east of Suez. Kuwait had previously been a British responsibility. Blood was still being shed in the Iran-Iraq war. In Tehran, they commemorated their dead with a fountain. After eight grim years, both sides were exhausted and agreed to a truce. Ayatollah Khomeini said it was like drinking poison. <laughs> 
In Baghdad, Saddam Hussein hailed his war as a great victory. Despite his boast, this was not a victory. The Iran-Iraq war was not a victory for Saddam Hussein. He survived. That's the most that he can say. But it was tremendously costly. He went deep into debt. He sacrificed a lot of people to a mad ambition. The estimates of the debt that Iraq amassed during the war with Iran were in the neighborhood of 75 to 80 billion dollars. He had mortgaged the future by conducting this war and by insisting on conducting it in the way he did. The great gambler had to make good on the mess that he had created. Oil prices had to rise at a phenomenal rate. Other producers had to get out of his way. The Kuwaitis and the United Arab Emirates had to lower their production. The entire market forces had been disrupted, and this man had no time. I mean, he couldn't wait for, for a turnaround in, in, in the economic picture. And he tried to coerce his Arab brothers into forgiving the debts. Kuwait refused. This was one of their cardinal sins in Saddam Hussein's eyes. In the early morning hours of August 2nd, 1990, Iraqi troops invaded Kuwait. The West feared that if Saddam advanced into Saudi Arabia, he would control nearly half the world's entire oil supply. Kuwaiti resistance was snuffed out. This was one of history's great stick-ups. This was Saddam Hussein, desperate for cash, looking around at a small, very rich neighbor. Why do you hold up the bank? Well, that's where the money is. And that was Saddam. Kuwait was, was the most convenient target. It was nearby. He could squeeze it. He could blackmail it. He could frighten it into submission. And when it all failed, uh, he, could, uh, he could walk in as he walked in on August 2nd. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. After massive aerial bombardment, the Allied forces invaded Kuwait. I assume that Kuwait was a small country in Africa. I don't think the United States will come all the way in order to liberate Kuwait, an African state. It's only because of oil that we had the Gulf War. As a matter of fact, oil was the reason why Iraq invaded Kuwait. And it was the reason why we had the Americans to the area with all the other allied forces. In less than 100 hours, the Gulf War was over. Saddam Hussein was defeated, but lived to fight another day. After the guns fell silent, what's the meaning of Desert Storm? This was an interregnum. This was a period of time between two orders of power. First, the British had been ascendant. Then came the Iranian bid. Then came the local Iraqi bid, and one of them just collapsed of its sheer weight, and one of them was defeated in war. So we take a look at this 20 years, between 1971 and 1991, as a time when the region was left to find its own balance, and it failed. And now the Americans are there, and they're there for the long haul. A circle is closed. Shortly after Saddam Hussein's army invaded Kuwait, oil prices rocketed to $40 a barrel. By the time Kuwait was liberated, prices had tumbled. Tumbled so low that after four wars and three oil crises, the real price of a barrel was back to where it had been in the mid-1970s. had feared at some time of the whole Gulf area going up in flames, as literally it did in Kuwait. And, of course, a tremendous blow to world stability and a scramble for energy. But, of course, that instability is always present, and that's why, of course, 
the major oil companies are looking further and further away from the Gulf area for new supplies. In deeper waters offshore Gulf of Mexico, in Colombia, even going into what 10, 15 years ago would have been considered totally politically hostile territory like Vietnam. One is trying to get away from that Gulf tinderbox, which one can see can typically explode at any moment. Next, on the prize, the new order of oil. Oil revolutionized the world, but the burning oil fields of Kuwait were a bitter reminder that the very essence that could bring untold power and riches to the world could also sow the seeds of its destruction. The rise of the environmental conscience now brings forth the question, does big oil have a future? Based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book by Daniel Jurgen, The Prize. On a hillside in Azerbaijan, gas seeps from the oil deposits beneath the earth and spontaneously ignites. Close by, a sacred flame, symbol of divine power, has burned in a Zoroastrian temple for a thousand years. In the 20th century, the mysterious black fluid on which it feeds has been the maker of a very different world. In 1991, after his defeat in the Gulf War, the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein set fire to the oil fields of Kuwait. Oil has brought many benefits to modern society in this century, and oil has been at the center of economic conflict, political struggle, and war. Now it faces a whole new challenge, the rise of the environmental conscience. I think history might show that just as Chernobyl illustrated the horrors and dangers of nuclear power, the Gulf War underlined the real costs of the oil economy in terms of its impacts on the environment, human suffering, and ultimately war. The war is over, the fires are out, but every day in the United States, a similar quantity of oil, the day, is burned and goes out the exhaust pipes of their cars.
Los Angeles is the city that oil made. And oil is the biggest business on Earth. Los Angeles, golden city of the American sunset. It's built on a pool of oil. But here we don't burn that oil ceremonially. We just burn that oil for power to push our cars. A hydrocarbon society, the American dream. The center of it, a moving automobile. I'm Roger Kennedy, the director of the National Museum of American History, and like all Americans, an automobile addict. American motorists drive two trillion miles a year. Good afternoon. I'm Earl Smith, and I'm out doing what I love to do, driving my car. And somewhere in the world, a new car rolls off the assembly line every second. My name is Laura Crossan. I am an actress and a writer, and I work in a hospital. We're driving on the Hollywood freeway right now. Every day, enough new cars hit the road to form a traffic jam 375 miles long. And every single day of the year, humankind produces one and a third billion dollars worth of crude oil. From his office on the 42nd floor, the chairman of ARCO, America's eighth largest oil company, manages an $18 billion a year business. But ARCO is only a cog in this, the industry that drives the modern world. Well, the 20th century has been called the age of oil. It has caused countries to go to war with each other in order to control oil sources. It's uh, provided enormous uh, revenues to different countries, and politically that's terribly important. It affects our daily lives, the quality of our lives. It just permeates the entire societies around the world. Oil is the lifeblood of the global economy. It provides us with plastics, chemicals, and fertilizers. But more than anything else, it provides us with mobility. Motor vehicles consume half of the oil used in the United States. And the reason for that rate of consumption is a love affair peculiar to our time. You know, a lot of people from other places just don't understand it, but in California, you are your car. You've got to have one. It's a basic necessity. It's kind of like toothbrush, floss, your car. You've got to have it. I love the feeling of independence and freedom that this car brings me. This car is as much a part of my private life as my living room is. However, I'm also paying a very high price. I'm contributing to smog. I'm contributing to the gridlock in the city, and I know that. But I cannot do all the things that I usually do in the course of one day if I had to depend on public transportation here. I'm using an awful lot of petroleum. And every time I use some more, it means that the earth I inhabit is impoverished to that extent. And the air is dirtier and the ground is dirtier. And there's less of this planet Earth that's worth inhabiting. When after 1940, the American century started, it was projecting the image of the good times as containing the car as an absolutely essential element of it. Freedom of movement, the privacy of a car, the luxury of a car. Hollywood has sold around the world the image of the car, the freeway, and the personal freedom that it creates. But it is also here that concern for the environment is the greatest and is the most dynamic and volatile issue on the new political agenda. Smog in the Los Angeles area is the worst in America. Californians were the first to realize that they were poisoning the air they breathe, and they passed laws to stop it. California today is really at the forefront of global environmental regulation. And when we look back on the 1990s, we may end up saying that the regulators and legislators in California 
were at least as influential, if not more influential, than OPEC ministers in determining the future state and future shape of the world oil industry. Tough new regulations say that in another 10 years, 10% 10 of all new vehicles sold here must emit no pollution at all. So large is the California car market that manufacturers everywhere must fall into line. It's ironic that here in the Magic City, a new model of energy consumption and concern for the environment is being created and that could well spell the demise of the oil age. One of the consequences of uh, the new environmental uh, era is not only substantive compliance, but what might be called figurative compliance. For instance, off uh, the coast of California, you find facilities that to the naked eye look not like oil platforms, but look like lush tropical condominium communities, complete with waterfalls and palm trees. When companies drill near the coastline here, they feel compelled to conceal their presence. Arcos facility off the Los Angeles coast has been transformed into Fantasy Island. It's the industrial version of cosmetic dentistry. There is a price to be paid for this. It is now virtually impossible to drill for oil in some of the most promising areas of the United States. There may be as much as 13 billion barrels of oil off the U.S. coastline that the American oil industry is not allowed to touch. California may care about its environment, but it does burn more gasoline in a day than Germany or Japan. Now, ever since I was a young guy, I remember wanting a nice car, a sports car, a red car. And now that I have it, I can honestly say I don't think I could live without it. I enjoy it. It's a rush that I get from just seeing a beautiful car, something sleek, something fast. An oil man and rancher, Robert O. Anderson is a legend of the oil business. While semi-retired, he formed a $100 million oil company just to keep his hand in. Now the man who opened up the rich oil fields of Alaska senses a new mood in his industry. The industry definitely is under something of a siege mentality. Uh, the Exxon Valdez incident really brought it to a crisis or brought it to a head is the real thing that haunts the industry. It could happen to anyone. The 1989 oil spill disaster caused by the tanker Exxon Valdez was a watershed in the history of the oil industry. Exxon spent billions of dollars cleaning up the damage and settling lawsuits. The harm done to Alaska's marine and wildlife caught the public imagination and galvanized the environmental movement. As a result, America's coastlines became obstacle courses for the oil industry. In order to move oil from Alaska down to the west coast of California involves complying with environmental regulations. The amount of environmental regulations has grown and grown over the last few years. In order to move uh, oil from the Gulf Coast of the United States up to the East Coast, a shipper must comply with upwards of 10,000 separate environmental regulations. We are the bad people, the oil companies, you know. We, we make a product that pollutes the atmosphere and everything else. But on the other hand, we produce it and make it because there is a public demand for it. Demand for oil is here, and we're the ones who are causing that fight for decent air and a decent world to be lost because we keep wanting to use more oil. Anything happening in Russia? Well, you might tell me a little bit about uh, what's happening in China today. Is Walter back yet? A popular notion that the oil industry in the United States has enormous political power
I think is overstated. I kind of feel like the oil industry in the U.S. is undergoing what happened to the stature in my office. Uh, as you can see, it's been carved up pretty badly over the years, and that's beginning to happen to us. The real price of gasoline in the United States is about as cheap as it's been since World War II, and the American industry has lost half a million jobs in the last 10 years. Robert O. Anderson believes that though the American oil industry has fueled the nation's economic and military might for more than a century, its glory days as an oil producer are over. The Japanese have a term for it, a sunset industry. It means that it's going to go down over the horizon. The domestic oil industry is clearly in a sunset phase. Every year, our production goes down, uh, the lowest in 50 years. The world industry isn't going to be more than 10, 15 years behind it. The United States was once the world's largest oil exporter. Now it imports 45% of its oil, a figure that seems certain to rise. A decade ago, perhaps a senior oil man would have felt uh, controversial but important. Today, there's this feeling not only of defensiveness, but maybe almost of irrelevance, that at least in a country like the United States, which was the home of the oil industry, uh, that the country doesn't want to have an oil industry. And therefore, as a result, you see a migration that's occurring away from the United States out to other parts of the world that do want to have an oil industry. Oil contributes at least 95% of the total hard currency earnings of the Nigerian economy. The environmental lobby could be a problem for Nigeria because if it caused, if it caused the countries to use less oil, it would mean a drop in revenue for Nigeria and ultimately economic calamity. Countries like Venezuela and other producers are obviously affected by environmental standards. But we must have realistic targets. And some of the targets, uh, if implemented, as some environmentalists believe, would cause major disruptions in economic life. A tropical rainforest in Mexico, hundreds of miles from the nearest village. This virgin corner of Central America could be almost anywhere in the third world, where vast new reserves of oil are being sought and found in the great global oil hunt. Here, where the local language is not Spanish, but Sonsil. Indian laborers working for the state oil company are cutting seismic lines in the forest, opening up paths for the oil geologists. You are damned if you don't have oil because you don't have cash and you cannot develop. And you're damned if you do have oil because you have cash, you develop, and in 25 years, you have to pay the environmental price. Many developing countries today need ready cash. Oil, to them, is gold. And it is gold because it is immediately bankable, it produces cash on site, and this has meant that very many nations are now willing to explore and exploit oil in their territories. The coming of oil means jobs and money for these workers and their country. In the 1970s, third world countries still saw foreign oil companies as neo-colonialist exploiters. Today, that's changing. 20 years ago, the world oil industry was dominated really by oil nationalism as countries took control of the resources within their border. Today, that's really changed quite dramatically. And from Vietnam to Venezuela, you see uh, a new opening to international oil industries. Quite right. Uh, I took part in helping to expropriate these assets. I also uh, uh, took part last week in announcing operating contracts with a number of companies to develop uh, 
inactive fields in Venezuela. So the circle has come around completely. Certainly one of the great ironies is that Vietnam today is offering about the best terms and the most attractive terms to oil companies of any country in the entire world. And uh, throughout Latin America, you see uh, the reappearance of international companies invited in to bring their skills, their capital, and their technologies into what had been nationalized uh, domestic oil industries. Some of the biggest oil companies in the world are the state-owned companies of Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. The bulk of the world's oil reserves belong to them, and they are beginning to compete with the major Western oil companies. In the meantime, the specter of oil shortage has, for the time being, been banished. The world has more than a trillion barrels of proven reserves, enough at current rates of consumption to last for 50 years. The major oil companies remain the epitome of the multinational, running global enterprises on a grand scale. The biggest of them all is Shell. We operate more than 100 countries in any year, one or two of those countries, by definition, are almost certain to go sour. We're used to wars or civil wars or coups, whatever it is. We ride the rough and the smooth. And, uh, you know, if you have a wide enough spread of your chips, if you like, on the table, you can survive. Two thirds of the world's proven oil reserves are in the Middle East. In the first weeks of 1991, the world was reminded that power grows not only from the barrel of a gun, but from a barrel of oil. The Gulf War is already history, and three hours' drive from Hollywood, these U.S. Marines have been reenacting their war exploits for a TV miniseries. But before that, these men and these tanks were in the front line of Operation Desert Storm. When the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, I was having dinner with my American colleague. And when we heard the news, we both went off to the Security Council and we judged the vital importance of it being a breach of international law at a time when the community of the world was trying to establish international law. Now, the way in which that war developed, and in fact, ground forces were committed and force was used, was obviously connected with oil. Gunner, Colac, two sets of troops. Left troops first. Come left, come left, come left. Get by, fire! On the way! Target right troops. At the outset, I thought the Gulf War would probably caused the American people to be more concerned about our declining production in this country. During the conflict, the world supply situation was very snug. So if you continue to, to reduce production here, over time we have less capability in future years to try to protect uh, sources elsewhere. The Gulf War really emphasized once again just how dependent we are on oil. What would be the risk to our economies if Saudi Arabia had gone down too to an invasion? And the risk would have been horrific, because then you would have had Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq in the hands of one man. You now, oil is certainly still a strategic commodity. I think the big thing that the Gulf War showed, which in a way is a little worrying, is that hitherto we had OPEC had, had, has, had, had historically had four or five millions of barrels a day of spare capacity. Over the last period, 18 months or so, we've had no spare capacity in the system. In the first months of the Gulf crisis, the loss of oil from Kuwait and Iraq pushed prices up sharply. 
but prices fell as other oil producers cranked up production in order to get relief oil onto the market. Oil producing countries saw that their interests lay with their customers, the West. There was little panic in the industrial countries, not even in Japan. Uh, oil is produced in so many countries in the world, and market forces work so well that no one, not Saddam Hussein or even OPEC, can effectively use oil as a political weapon. <laughs> My name is Atsushi Meguro. I live in Tokyo and I love driving. Japan has no real natural resources, especially oil, and it just feels very vulnerable in the sense that it can't control its own future. We lost World War II, so we changed our policy from military to economic growth. So at that point, we need the national resources, I mean, especially oil, to make the economic accomplishment. Oil is the blood of the 20th century. It's quite simple. Everybody cannot imagine his or her life without the oil. Naohiro Amaya has written that the 20th century has been the age of oil. Oil power made this the American century. And it was oil that helped America defeat Japan in the Second World War. After the war, everybody wanted to emulate the Americans, the oil civilization. Other people were fascinated by this American way of life. Europeans and Japanese succeeded in doing so. Russians, Chinese, Indians, Africans, uh, those people so far are not successful. More than anyone else, Naohiro Amaya persuaded the Japanese to shift their industrial strategy away from oil. He convinced his government that the age of oil was coming to an end, that the next century will be the age of information. The Japanese are a good example of a country which has very little in the way of hydrocarbon resources, but has made admirable use of what it has and has used other sources of energy to, power its, to, to satisfy its power needs, in particular nuclear energy. But Japan is also the place which has perfected many of the forms of information technology. And where some of the electronic revolution has taken place, I think it's more than a coincidence it should take place in Japan, where in fact a low energy society has begun to grow and maybe a low energy society will grow out of the end of the hydrocarbon age. We cannot give up the dependence on oil. It's impossible. Uh, even though in, uh, the information technology develops, still we have to use a certain amount of oil. However, the knowledge technology will make it possible for us to save the energy consumption to some extent. Japan is the second biggest importer of oil after the United States, and 57% of its energy is still oil-based. The Japanese know all too well that their hard-earned prosperity could fade into the night if other nations were to deny them oil. Any uh, consuming countries relying heavily on the imported crude oil would try to diversify sources of crude oil for the economic stability and also in order to avoid any uh, types of uh, oil crisis, which we have experienced in, during the 70s and quite recently during the Gulf crisis. Today, many Japanese are taking a long, hard look at the vast territories of the former Soviet Union. 
Siberia is geographically close to Japan and could provide an alternative to the unstable Middle East. Some believe that Japanese money and American know-how will one day unlock East Siberia's wealth of oil and natural gas. If you went around the world today and talked uh, to people throughout the international oil industry, particularly geologists, and said, what part of the world are you most excited about? The answer from all of them would be almost uniform, the former Soviet Union. In the suburbs of Moscow, the commissars and the apparatchiks are moving out, and the Western oil men are moving in. The country dachas of the old party bosses are being taken over by their old enemy. Until pretty recently, the very amount of oil reserves in what was the Soviet Union was a state secret. But over the last three or four years, as the doors have opened there, the knowledge base has gone up. And there is a view today that the oil reserves of the former Soviet Union may be on the scale of a Saudi Arabia, not as cheap and easy to produce by any means as a Saudi Arabia. But in other words, you're talking about one of the potentially great oil plays of the world. It's very nice to go back to countries you were kicked out of a long time ago. I mean, Russia was, in fact, you know, in fact, the cradle after the United States. It was, this, it was the non-U.S. cradle of the non-U.S. industry. So we were kicked out in 1917, of course, and 75 years later, we're getting back. Great. It always happens in the end. It's 40 below zero in Western Siberia. The first foreign oil derricks were brought here from Texas. This Russian-American joint venture was financed with American capital. We're the only ones here because we were the first one to step to the plate to do it. And everyone else is cautiously watching to see if we succeed. Many other oil companies are gonna follow behind us. It's gonna be a massive investment in oil industry in Russia and in Siberia. And what's really at stake here is the economy of the Soviet Union and the future well-being of the country. So to the extent that White Knights succeeds, additional capital investment will be brought into the Soviet Union to help develop their oil industry for much needed hard currency to build the economy here. The development of a nation that has been held back due to political circumstances. It's the unleashing of perhaps the next capitalistic frontier in the world. And certainly the unleashing of one of the great remaining oil provinces to be fully developed. The oil industry is used to going to parts of the world where things are uncertain, where there's a lot of political risk, but it's hard to find a situation that is more confused uh, than they face today in the former Soviet Union. And what's really holding back development is, is the uncertainty of lack of a political foundation, contractual foundation, financial foundation, and the basic question of who's in charge? Who do you make a deal with? And can the person that you make a deal with stick to it? White Knights. The only foreign company drilling new wells here was forced to put its Siberian operations on ice for a while when an arbitrary new tax law made the enterprise unprofitable. The great post-Soviet oil play is beset with political uncertainty. We don't yet know whether, in fact, the Soviet Union or the, its constituent parts can possibly survive the next 10 years without major disruption. Uh, is that huge quantity of the Earth's surface going to break up into other states? And what's going to happen before, in fact, this, this situation over the oil reserves can be turned around? It's really at a crossroads, and it could head uh, down a rather nasty road, or it could head towards quite a good political and economic road. I hope for their sake they take the latter. A marriage of Western capital and Russian resources could provide the answer. But what ordinary Muscovites want from this partnership is some evidence that the benefits will reach them.
Not long ago, a newly married couple drove into a filling station to find, as usual, only two of the six pumps working. The bride and groom got stuck in a line and arrived two hours late for their own wedding reception. More than material prosperity is at stake, the peaceful transition to democracy requires an economic revival, which will depend heavily on oil and natural gas. Oil will be important as a sort of safety net or as a sort of floor. Uh, Russia, with its uh, natural resources, is a country that is in economic shambles today. But without oil, it would be an economic calamity. The former Soviet Union is still the largest oil producer in the world, but its antiquated industry is on the verge of collapse. The oil fields are symptomatic of Soviet mismanagement. In the last five years, production has dropped by 30%. Because of poor maintenance, 20,000 wells are not working. Wasteful and inefficient at the best of times, the industry is now counting on help from the West. It's going to be quite difficult because I believe the infrastructure has virtually collapsed. So that uh, the pipelines are leaking, the machinery is out of date, production is falling and all that. And so the first thing is to get the existing system back something like where it was. In Baku, the cradle of the old Russian oil industry, 19th century equipment is still at work. Nothing lives in these lakes. They are pure oil. This is just one of the many ecological catastrophes that with the collapse of communism have come to light throughout the former Soviet empire. Here, oil leaks from 37,000 miles of ill-repaired pipeline every year. Some estimate this ecological catastrophe to be the equivalent of 400 Exxon Valdez accidents. The native peoples have suffered most. The Soviet oil industry polluted great tracts of their hitherto unspoiled forest and tundra. White Nights is a sensitive to the environment here in Russia uh, and in Siberia as it would be anywhere in the United States. Uh, the tundra here is very sensitive. The lichen takes 30 years to grow, and we want to have a minimal effect with our presence here. We're very honored to be here with you today to represent White Nights. Нам доставляет большую честь быть здесь сегодня с вами. The Russian team that drilled for oil here in Raduzhny, Western Siberia, destroyed the hunting grounds of the Kanti people. Today, their new American partners are reaching out to the villagers. We would like to present you, the people of the village, in a forest with uh, ten snowmobiles. We wanted to give the residents of the village ten And so the Hydrocarbon Society comes to the Siberian village. Gasoline-driven snowmobiles replaced the reindeer herds decimated by the old Soviet oil industry. <laughs> Western oil companies must contend with this grim environmental legacy. They are applying new technology to the problem and bringing their higher Western environmental standards and awareness. There's a difference between the people who are making the decisions today in these companies and 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a, in a sense, just a, a rejection of the environmental consideration. Today, the decision makers recognize it's a, it's a reality and uh, they may even share the values. Certainly their children share the values and they realize it's something that they have to deal with and it's going to continue to be with us. The rapid growth of Mexico City has made it the largest city in the world. It is also one of the most polluted. Mariachi singers sing of oil. 
Their song calls petroleum the gift of the devil. The Mexican government is actively pursuing a $4 billion program to clean up a city. You look at Mexico City, congestion, pollution, and you, you wonder whether we are not all trapped. If every city is going to be like Los Angeles, God help us. If we think of the South Asian market with uh, about one and a half billion people before very long, or the Chinese market. And if you think of those people having, let us say, one car per two families even, you know, you really are talking about an amount of oil consumption and an amount of pollution which would seriously affect the Earth's environment. The growth in petroleum is really in the third world. Uh, their consumption of oil, for example, has gone up by two and a half times over the last 20 years. It could easily double again over the next uh, 20. Uh, it's, it's, and, and even then, you wouldn't have scratched it. I mean, give every person in China a Vespa scooter, you'd have an energy crisis tomorrow. <laughs> a slum called Netza on the outskirts of Mexico City. People here live in poverty, but not without cars. The ideal world in Latin America is represented in a bad American movie full of cars uh, and lots of consumer goods, uh, cans of Coca-Cola and a TV set. This generates a wish or an aspiration in the masses for them, it is some kind of a cachet to own a television set or to own a car and have no roads. Oil is still seen as the shortcut to the consumer society. The possible ecological consequences would seem distant and unimportant to those who are denied Western prosperity. It will not do to tell the third world, well, this is the cheap alternative, this is for your own good, although we don't have it, this is for your own good. The third world will not do that. They'll only do things which they consider to be part of a glamorous prosperity. We have such problems as malnutrition, poverty, a health crisis, political instability, and all of these impinge so much on people's daily lives that they need to sort out these problems first before they will come to the problems of the environment. I therefore don't see them addressing the problems of the environment for another 20 or 30 years. We're likely to see in the 1990s a, a new North-South confrontation. The North will put increasing emphasis on environmental restrictions and regulations on the environmental agenda, while the South will be much more focused on economic growth, having the same opportunities to grow that the industrial countries of the North have had, and the growth that the South needs because of its growing populations. The North wants to retain the status quo. The South wants to change it. So in a nutshell, the North is telling the South, you cannot develop in this same way, so tough luck. And the South is telling the North, we will develop, that we will go on polluting. In the sea of poverty, there is no democracy. So this poverty should be overcome, but at the same time, the environmental problem should be solved. This is a very hard question challenging the human wisdom. So far, no answer. The information technology, the information village that we live in today means that everyone around the world wants to adopt our lifestyle, wants to follow our mode of consuming oil. But if everyone does that, it's not sustainable. <laughs> 
the political problems, the economic problems, the environmental, the pollution problems would mean that the world would explode. And it's that power that's going to lead to the development of new forms of energy, the high-tech energy of the future. It was California, the most populous state in America, that perfected the oil-burning lifestyle. Ultimately, technology will determine how long that lifestyle lasts. Doesn't seem to me hopeless at all. The uh, oil society has built up an awful lot of wealth which can be redeployed all the time if we have the political will to make a new kind of society with new kinds of energy and maybe a little more self-control in the next century. We've done this sort of thing before. We're not so dumb as all that. It takes an awful lot of brains to dig for oil and go after it. Those kinds of brains can dig for other kinds of energy, too. Cars built before 1970 are the biggest polluters. One beloved old gas guzzler can cause as much pollution as 100 of the new cars. And the new cars are getting cleaner. America's cars are 50% more fuel efficient now than they were 20 years ago. And alternatives to gasoline exist already. One day, electrically powered cars like this Japanese prototype could become a common sight. But before they do, considerable economic and technical problems will have to be overcome. Meanwhile, cleaner cars and cleaner gasolines have already reduced Los Angeles smog by 25% in the last 10 years. There's a growing view that the transitional fuel for the future is going to be natural gas, uh, that the oil industry, oil companies, really over half their reserves in many cases are natural gas. The natural gas will be used more for electric generation, perhaps in vehicles, and maybe some say in the 21st century, instead of talking about an oil and gas industry, we'll talk about a gas and oil industry. Cars powered by natural gas reduce pollution. Major oil companies are big producers of natural gas. In Southern California, the US mail and private courier services are experimenting with natural gas-fueled fleets. But many of the new technologies are expensive, whereas gasoline remains cheap, plentiful, and efficient. There really isn't an alternative, so far anyway, to the internal combustion engine. It's very difficult to see an alternative, especially for transport, because gasoline in particular and kerosene for airplanes, they're both extraordinarily efficient fuels. Oil and gas will be major industries 50 and probably even 100 years hence. So we'll be around. Oil has been a business of technological change ever since the first well was drilled. Today, the environmental conscience is galvanizing a vast range of new innovations. The future will be determined by a horse race among technologies, and billions of dollars of investment will be wagered on the outcome. People have been predicting the end of the oil age for many years. It's my prediction that the oil age will continue well into the next century, with oil and gas and coal playing a major role in terms of supplying energy to the world. And of course, energy is what makes the quality of life good. People enjoy it. It uh, increases the, their ability to enjoy the finer things of life. In the end, what a British statesman said over 40 years ago still stands today. The kingdom of heaven runs on righteousness, but the kingdom of earth runs on oil. There's a lot of smog in Los Angeles, and like everybody else, I'm very concerned about that. But I must admit that when I get in my car and I step on the gas, I get over it. In the years since Errol Smith zoomed off in his red sports car, 
much has changed. Oil prices reached high levels that would have seemed inconceivable. They also crashed three times. Russia, in such disarray in the early 1990s, came back in a very big way to become the world's largest oil producer. Demand for oil flattened out in the industrial countries, but has taken off in the developing world, the emerging markets. China was a minor oil exporter at the beginning of the 1990s. Today, it is the world's largest oil importer, surpassing the United States. Climate change went from being an obscure, abstract issue to the subject of a global consensus on emissions by almost 200 countries, giving a new boost to an already growing renewable energy industry. Conventional energy continued to grow. Canadian oil sands became a major new supply and the number one source of U.S. petroleum imports. And while some were arguing that oil was running out, an unconventional revolution in North America brought shale gas and shale oil into the energy mix with far-reaching impact. But in other ways, the story told in the prize has remained on track. The oil industry continued to advance its technology at ever greater scale. The Middle East remains a region of turmoil and conflict and uncertainty, and oil continues to be deeply entwined with turbulent geopolitics. The spending to bring new oil and gas resources continues to grow, measured in many trillions of dollars. Since the early 1990s, the number of cars in the world has more than doubled to almost a billion. Some are hybrids, and the electric car has reappeared after a century-long absence. But most of them are fueled by gasoline and diesel, and overall, the global car fleet is expected to reach two billion within another quarter century. The world is using almost 40% more oil than it did in the early 1990s. Oil remains the fuel of economic growth, and even as new technologies come in, the resource that is fundamental to the very movement of modern civilization. So oil remains as it has been, a complex and dramatic story of technology, economics, politics, of ambition and dreams, and of what people want and how they want to live. It is an epic story that continues to unfold on a global scale. A century ago, Winston Churchill called oil the prize. And a century later, oil remains the prize. <laughs>